thank you for that generous uh, and, and, and personal uh, introduction because it does say a lot why I'm here today. And um, I hate to admit it, but I forgot it was the 20th anniversary. Uh, and so I've been getting calls from the press, like, well, you know, what's, you know, what's uh, going on? Um, and the other thing is I want to thank you for staying because I know this is like tough sledding on my part. Uh, at the end of the day, and standing between you and the reception. And so uh, when Frank called me, I realized that that was going to be my task, and um, he must have caught me um, when I was thinking about something else, and I agreed um, for, um, for this time period. But I'm, I'm really happy to, to be here and talking about some of the history of some of the things that we've talked about today. But I want to start out with the Sankofa bird. And the reason I want to start out with the Sankofa bird, the Sankofa bird is from um, what a kind of people of West Africa. And that the bird, in order to move forward, looks backward. And so and that's the, one of the major themes of uh, my talk uh, this evening. And I want to, we're going to talk about examining the role of historical analysis in our understanding of uh, racial and ethnic disparities in health and health care. And also, I want to present a historical framework. And I like doing case studies. And my case study is going to be looking at tuberculosis in African uh, Americans. Um, the other thing is I, I want to talk about the campaigns that were started by the African American community in responses in the late 19th and early 20th century, because I think sometimes people forget that there were communities working against um, these injustices in healthcare long before some of the government or even foundation uh, reports. And then to talk about what are some of the lessons learned from history for contemporary uh, uh, researchers and health policy makers. This is, um, and, and the, the British do this a little better than we do in terms of having historians work with policy makers. And so I wanted to start with this quote from uh, John Tosh, not John Tesh, who used to be on entertainment uh, uh, tonight. Uh, someone said, John, I don't know John Tesh did. <laughs> He also dated, uh, John Tesh also dated Oprah for a short while. Um, and that is to know about the past, is to know that things have not always been as they are now, and by implication, that they need not remain the same in the future. And I, and, and I, I think that this is critical because about, oh, this is taking such a long time. Yes, it will take a long time. Um, I once said to someone, if you're that pessimistic thinking, I'd still be in chains. So you know we have to you know keep keep at it, um, and later I'll show you a, a, a graphic illustration of what I meant about and what's still been in chains. Uh, and so that you know history is about change. Things have changed, maybe not to the extent we want them, but they have changed. I remember you know being at a meeting once with Tom Levine, and I said, Tom, we were we've been doing this work so long, and so many of you in this room before there's money in. So here we're talking about, well, what foundation is going to give you money? You know, we, you have a group of people here together. There was, talking about loneliness and isolation, there are a number of us working loneliness, isolation, and no money. So, so things have changed. I mean, and this is from, uh, this is a quote from Elizabeth Fee, who used to be at Johns Hopkins, was also, used to be head of, of the, the uh, Center for History at the National Library of Medicine. And she talks about engaged histories. And in this quote, she talks about history can stimulate our imaginations, show us alternative realities, and enhance our sense of agency. And I'm really going to talk about agency because um, the African American community did not just sit still when there were these inequities in health care. The idea that we can make a difference and that it's worth trying to do so even and perhaps especially when the immediate conditions in the world around uh, seem so discouraging. So this is another, many, and I picked these before, uh, these quotes before I was here today, because I understand how hard it is and why it's important to have some type of hope. Now this quote is a, is, is a little longer, and I'm not going to read the whole thing, but what I want to uh, point out is every social phenomenon is the result of historical process. I just 
leaders there so in terms of what has happened uh, in the past and how it affects us today. Now, in a some of your thinking, what is she doing here? You know, the historian, you know, I think, you know, and I'm probably, you know, with the choir, but, but sometimes I'm not with the choir. So I want to talk about history as a research methodology in health policy research. One of the things that history does, it can set the question. Today, when Sarah gave her presentation, I, she had a slide which I could scream for historical analysis. And that slide was when she said that in the terms of the breast cancer mortality, and black women that, that it started to diverge in the 1970s. I saw that as a, what happened in the 1970s? Did, was it the same in all communities? Uh, were there some communities where it stayed the same? But the historical analysis can help ask, you know, was there some funding cuts? What, um, was there some, was it because there was some environmental, you know, a catastrophe something? But those are some of the questions that I think that history can complement some of the, um, the, the more quantitative uh, data. The other thing that history does is identifies patterns, trends, and key actors. But also in terms of identifying patterns, trends, and key actors, it can also help us decide what decisions were made and why they were made. Were there some um, solutions in terms of helping us I think, um, eliminate um, racial and ethnic health disparities? Was there some uh, program that wasn't adopted at that particular time, but maybe now is the right time? It helps us, helps us to examine uh, assumptions. I mean, one of the things that sometimes happens, you know, in public health is that, well, the assumption that um, the uh, that the, the last um, flu uh, epidemic was just like 1918. We can test those assumptions. I mean, th things have changed between 1918 and um, uh, the 21st century. It also helps us test analogies, which are sometimes false. There are a lot of times when people will say, well, you know, it's just like the syphilis study. And it's sometimes it's not like the syphilis study, but it's become a uh, shorthand. It also provides background, context, comparison, and depth. In, certain, in terms of looking at local studies, trying to figure out some of, of, of the causal factors. The other thing, um, Berlin uh, Chawakwin, uh, last year wrote this article about history and um, racial disparities research. And he suggests that one of the things that people who do uh, health disparities research is look at some of the historical, really deep historical studies that looked at urban decline after World War II to try and figure out, these are deeper studies to see what was happening in a particular place in terms of um, health disparities. The other thing he suggests that we do is to perhaps look at some other funding program that was very active. In the 80s and 90s, if we were sitting around here, we probably would have be at a conference about the underclass and, uh, and poverty, funded by a whole bunch of organizations, even some federal agencies. But that's not being funded anymore. Why is that? What happened? Can we have some lessons to learn from that in terms of making sure that health disparities research continues to be funded? The other thing that I think um, history does, it looks at past strategies and policies, but also helps us understand the broader context of looking at it not just as um, one factor, but many factors. I'm going to briefly go through this in terms of what history can help in terms of looking at um, racial health disparities research. One, something that has come up a lot um, today is that race and even ethnicity is an evolving concept. The names have it, it has changed. Uh, that it's, it's not you know, an ironclad concept. The, the other thing is how racial attitudes have influenced medical and public health policy but also how medical and public health policy has also influenced social policy, such as immigration. 
in terms of Mexicans uh, being seen as being tuberculous and that leading to deportation in Los Angeles of, 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 of Mexicans. Also details the various interpretations of racial differences and their consequences, you know, in terms of racial disparities and their consequences. And also makes plain that this has been a long history. But it have to, doesn't have to be this way. It wasn't like it was a natural phenomenon. And so that to help, I think history can help us think of this as, the, as that this is not just inevitable, to help undermine the aura of inevitability. Um, the other thing that in terms of looking at this, I think it illuminates some of the attitudes of racial and ethnic groups towards medicine and public health, and also the attitudes of health professionals towards these particular groups. It, it demonstrates the agency of racial and ethnic minorities in this country. That folks have not just sat and let this happen. And finally, it provides a mechanism to examine the experiences of members of racial and ethnic groups as patients and also as providers. Now, one of the reasons I, I wanted to put in uh, this 1984 report, Tom mentioned it earlier, that one of the problems in the 10 volumes, all, those of you who are interested in all 10 volumes, the Office of Minority Health has now the PDF of all volumes if you want to look at um, every, every volume. But one of the things about this report, it was, it was very historical. it was almost as if, you know, the health disparities, you know, popped out of a Margaret Hector's head, the way that, you know, Athena came, you know, out, you know, out of Zeus's head. Um, so, so I guess I wanted to try and cor correct this. So let's look at tuberculosis. Debbie E.D. Du Bois in 1906 said that the greatest enemy of the black race is consumption which is what tuberculosis was called in the late uh, 19th, early 20th century. And uh, according to Du Bois, that, that you see there was a large discrepancy in terms of the tuberculosis rate, this is not mortality rates, but tuberculosis rate in African Americans and in uh, white Americans. So this is Frederick L. Hoffman. And when I talk about Hoffman, I want to probably in a way, since we're kind of different people, that Tom was kind of nicer about this than I, in terms of reinforcing that policy does not just happen in the laws, halls of Congress, or in state legislatures. Okay. Of, because of Frederick L. Hoffman, black Americans of a certain age, and I count myself as one of them, did not have life insurance from Prudential. We had life insurance from Metropolitan. Why? Because Hoffman, in 1896, put out a book called Race Traits and Tendencies of the American Negro. At this time, there was some uh, civil rights uh, legislation in New Jersey saying that all people had to be covered for life insurance. Well, the, um, uh, um, Hoffman was a statistician at Prudential, and he said, no, you should not, um, you, you should not um, um, cover African Americans because they're going to die out soon. That they were, uh, that diseases such as tuberculosis would lead to their deaths because of their race traits and tendencies. There are some people went so far that said African Americans uh, had higher tuberculosis rates because of emancipation. Um, there's one person by the name Thomas Jefferson Mays who said that the way to deal with tuberculosis in black people was to uh, reinstitute slavery. This was in a medical journal. Um, some people weren't buying that one. Um, but the thing is, I think that after slavery, that the tuberculosis rates did increase because you know, people were moving to cities that were congested, and that there was no, no, no health care. So in terms of race traits and tendencies, Kaufman talks about anatomical and physiological differences, that black people were inferior. They were also inferior mentally, and they were also immoral. And he saw immorality as a race trait that was something that was in the body. So here, he said, you know, that 
black people were going to become extinct and that there was going to be a gradual extinction of the race. I guess we fooled Hoffman, but that this was believed at that particular time that that was going to happen. W.E.B. Du Bois responded to this and in talking about the undeniable fact is that, that in certain diseases, Negroes, that's what we were then, have a much higher rate than whites, and especially in consumption pneumonia and other diseases. But he asked the critical question, does that mean that it's racial? Does that mean that it's biological, that it's a part of the body? He said that, Hoffman says yes, but he said that uh, that, that was not the case. So, Du Bois responded, almost taking word for word, Hoffman's book, and has a book, The Health and Physique of the Negro American. Now, this is Charles Rowan. Um, he was head of the National Medical Association, also for a few years, uh, editor of the Journal of the National Medical Association, and he critiqued uh, in the Journal of the National Medical Association, Hoffman, because he said it gave comfort to racism. So what happened is that in May of 1906, Du Bois gathered together a number of activists in the black community, teachers, nurses, physicians, public health people to address the issue of tuberculosis and also the high death rates in the African American community. So it was seen as an expansive model, not as a medical issue. And the other thing is that they said that black people were not inferior uh, physiologically, but that it could be explained by conditions of life, the high uh, death rates. And I just want to point out this expansive view. In large part, African Americans had this expansive view, in large part because of racism. If you were a black physician, you weren't allowed in some of the medical organizations, and so you worked together. So this was a broader model to address health disparities. One of the people who worked in terms of looking at the social factors in, um, in racial uh, health disparities is this woman, Dr. Virginia Alexander, and I'm currently writing a biography, a book-length biography of, uh, of, of Dr. Alexander. She was born uh, in Philadelphia. Uh, her father had been a slave. This week, I got the ledger from um, the, the ledger about her father, this is here somewhere, right here. That's the ledger that the plantation owner's wife put down in terms of when her father was born. These are all their slaves. So she, as I said, she was born uh, to, uh, her father came to Philadelphia. Now, up the road is Waverly Plantation, where my family, what? My great-grandparents were born on Waverly Plantation. My grandfather was named Waverly. Point this out for two reasons. One, as I said, my great-grandparents were born a slave. So it's not that long ago um, that, 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 you know, in terms of slavery. And two, when I said that, you know, that we have to keep going, because that, uh, that slavery took a long time uh, to overcome. This, was, uh, this picture was taken in 1937 as a part of the Works Progress Administration when they went and took photos of uh, old uh, uh, plantations. Uh, Virginia Alexander uh, went to Penn. Here she is at the quad at Penn, I just love this photo. Um, that was the Delta, so it's a black sorority uh, at Penn. She went to Women's Medical College of, uh, of uh, Pennsylvania. Uh, she could not get an internship with a residency, so she had to go to a black hospital in uh, Kansas City. She came back to Philadelphia, and one of the things that you know, uh, she did was to start a practice. Now, this is an article written by W.E.D.B. Du Bois about her. 
Uh, they were very close. Uh, they were close professional colleagues, and they were close in the other way. Um, and so, uh, and his answer was yes. She could that she could be a, a colored woman could be a physician. She opened up a hospital. This is a license from her hospital uh, in Philadelphia. But what she started getting interested in was the social factors of health. Um, it was a three bed, you can hardly see. It says that she had a three bed lying in hospital, um, which, is, which is a returning hospital. When she came back to Philadelphia, she became a Quaker, started working with Quakers in terms of some of the of interracial work. She was very interested in interracial work. And she wrote a report in 1935 that looked at the social <coughs> aspects of healthcare in North Philadelphia. This came out of work she had done with the Quakers in terms of trying to get a, get a scientific approach to racism. I'm trying, I don't know yet what that means, but that is what they said. They wanted a scientific approach to um, uh, uh, to uh, combat racism. She worked with a white sociologist by the name of uh, George Simpson, who lived to be in his late 90s. Unfortunately, I was able to interview him before uh, he, he died. But one of the things that she did, she did a combination of quantitative and qualitative methods. She used vital statistics to show the poor health of uh, African Americans in North Philadelphia. She also surveyed families to find out what their socioeconomic status was. She documented racial discrimination in hospitals in Philadelphia uh, by uh, doing interviews with both patients this is, and physicians. My, this is 1935. And these are some of the patient narratives that she used. I didn't like St. Luke's and Children's Hospital Clinic. I wouldn't go there again. I had trouble getting my child into the hospital because the hospital had no isolation ward. Resident doctor called my child a cannibal because she didn't stop chewing gum the minute he asked her to stop. Um, I was told to go to Hahnemann for an operation, but I was afraid to go because they always tell you that you need an operation when you don't, and then you can't have any more babies. Uh, the other thing that Dr. Alexander did, she also uh, interviewed black physicians. Uh, there of the 50 black physicians in Philadelphia at this time, only five had hospital privileges except at uh, one of the two uh, black hospitals. And she talked about how she would call up on the phone to say, I have a patient coming. I'm coming to see you, but I'm a patient. She shows up. They see she's black. And they won't let her, you know, the intern you know, tells her she can't come into the hospital. In 1940, Dr. Alexander, because of her work, uh, looking at the social uh, aspects of health, received from this group called the Pennsylvania Institute of Negro Health. That's um, uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Alexander, not with the fancy uh, hat, uh, the more modest hat. She was the Quaker, remember? Um, uh, that she, um, for her work in uh, looking at social aspects of health, she stopped her practice and went to Yale Medical School uh, to get in their department in public health to get a doctorate in public health in 1937. She did not get her doctorate. She ended up in 1941 getting a master's in public health. The reason why she did not get her doctorate is that she developed lupus and um, because of her illness did not uh, uh, finish her, her degree. And so she was one of the African Americans at uh, the turn of the century really looking at how do we address disparities particularly in um, in, um, in tuberculosis. The other thing that Dr. Alexander did is I think that she's a prime example of what I call research-based activism. Because what she did, she documented that black physicians could not get hospital admitting privileges in Philadelphia, worked with the Quakers in this interracial uh, race relations committee, had the Quakers, on the basis of her research, push for the admission of black physicians in public hospitals in Philadelphia. So they used her research uh, uh, for, uh, for this activism. Briefly, there were some scientific and medical advances in the 19th century that are important to tuberculosis. Robert Koch in 1882 discovered the tubercle bacillus. 1895, Redkin uh, invented x-rays so that you could see you know, the lungs. But, Diseases, I'm going to skip this slide, it's too busy. 
Uh, but what I wanted to say in that slide, I say quicker, is that diseases are framed by who is the, uh, who suffers from the disease. This here is late 19th century images of tuberculosis. Very romantic, wasting away or being consumed by you know the disease. This is the image in terms of African Americans in the early 20th century. So that there was the same disease, but it was framed and interpreted very differently. When African Americans, Mexican Americans, and, and immigrants, even Jewish and Italian immigrants, had the disease. So that when we think about disease, we think about how it is experienced in different ways. Even though the tubercle bacillus caused the same disease, the patient experiences are very different. So African Americans push socioeconomic status. And as C.V. Roman said, all history shows that ignorance, poverty, and oppression are enemies of health and longevity. Du Bois said that if you put any person in the same situation that African Americans found themselves in, that they would get tuberculosis. This is from uh, Sam Roberts' book on uh, tuberculosis in Baltimore. And one of the things they talked about in Baltimore was that it was housing, that the poor housing led to uh, tuberculosis. Landlords uh, not keeping up with the housing. And so one of the approaches in uh, Baltimore was activists also worked to, uh, to try and improve housing. Now, the other thing that uh, uh, African Americans talked about was overdiagnosis. Today, I'm using this as talking about why there might have been uh, uh, over, you know, racism in terms of medical diagnosis. But in other audiences, I use it also as a critique of cultural competence, and I'll explain why I'm in. Rebecca Cole was the second black woman to get a medical degree in the United States. She got her degree in 1867 from the Women's Medical College of Pennsylvania. First black woman got her degree in 1867. And she says, on the point of death from consumption, I would say this, hosts of the poor are attended by young, inexperienced white physicians. They have inherited the traditions of their elders and let a black patient call. They immediately have visions of tubercles. And then sometimes with cultural confidence, people say, well, if it's a black person, they have this. And if it's a Mexican person, you have this. If it's Asian. And so that in terms of some of the stereotype, in, in, instead of going um, a, a bit deeper. But she says, let him die. And though in the case there may be good reason for a di difference of opinion, he writes tuberculosis. So that there might have been, uh, she thought, overdiagnosis and not trying to figure out what else was going on. There's also racial discrimination in terms of some of the death rates, in terms of not being able to get into a sanatorium. This letter is from um, a young man by Robert, named Robert Freeman, and he wrote to Lawrence Frit Flick, who um, was the superintendent at White, White Haven. It wasn't named White Haven because it only took whites, but it did only take whites uh, for a long time. Um, that um, he writes this letter about how hard he's working, how you know he's taking care of his parents, and I have tuberculosis, and I need a sanitarium. And he writes it, and then he writes, P.S. I am a colored boy. Do you take colored people? And you know, there are some times where, um, even though there was a greater need for uh, for healthcare facilities to take care of African Americans because of tuberculosis. It, it didn't happen. Indianapolis had no place for kids, black kids with tuberculosis to go. They would send kids to like fresh air camps. Um, so this is a woman who was a journalist and was involved in the Black Women's Club movement. They created such a facility for black kids in, um, uh, in Indianapolis. And, and it was like the, inter, it was the Indiana Federation of Color Women's Clubs. She also had a settlement, started a settlement house, but that it was health, living conditions, education altogether. So health and, uh, and approaching health was not separate from um, the broader categories of what they would call advancing the race. 
There was black, uh, separate black TV aside. This is one in uh, Southern Pines of uh, North Carolina for consumptive Negroes only. This is uh, in Maryland. This was the state hospital for African Americans uh, for, with who had tuberculosis. One of the things that happened was the stigmatization of black workers, especially women, in terms of black people were seen not as victims of disease, but as carriers of disease. And this is from um, uh, Tara Hunter's To Joy My Freedom, and it's um, a cartoon from the um, Atlanta General Constitution. And in terms of their, oh yeah, the average white home. And you see here, you know, contagious disease filters where the black people live, the maid comes and takes it to the average white home. Here is another one, you know, contagious disease, your butler, you know, your washerwoman, uh, you know, and how you know, when, when black people came to your home, um, they were carrying the disease. Sometimes uh, black people use such images to try to get white Americans to address health disparities. That is for, if not for uh, uh, charitable reasons, for self-interest. But black people were not alone in terms of being of, of being stigmatized. And that here is the industrialists and agriculturists in the West and in the Southwest and importing Mexican laborers are also importing a race sizzling with susceptibilities. The public health official is tilting at one mills and his attempt to reduce tuberculosis mortality if tuberculosis susceptibles are allowed to flock into this community. The Mexican will not, like the Indian, suffer or die alone, but will increase dissemination of infection in the community in which he was infected. So there were actions in Los Angeles to use tuberculosis as a way of stopping Mexican immigrants. I love this one, stop US officers auto club of Southern California. I don't know what the connection between the two was, but. But also deportation, mass deportation in the 1930s of Mexican, because they said that they would be an economic burden uh, to Los Angeles, and also that they would spread disease. Also, and I just want to briefly talk about some of the things about, about, uh, Ellis, uh, about Angel Island. Angel Island was with the primary detention center for Chinese and uh, Japanese uh, immigrants. And I want to point, bring this up because I think that when you look at history, we also have to figure out how communities talked about things. What were the mechanisms that they used? So those of you who don't know where Angel Island is, it's famous uh, it's in San Francisco Bay. There was a quarantine station there. There was medical inspection. But what some of the detainees at Angel Island did, they wrote about their life there on the walls. They were discovered just when Angel Island was about to be demolished. And because of the finding of this poetry, they kept it open. And I'll show you one of the poems. It is indeed pitiful, the harsh treatment of our fellow countrymen. The doctor extracting blood caused us the greatest anguish. Our stomachs are full of grievances, but to whom can we tell them? We can but pace to and fro, scratch our heads, and question the blue sky. Most of these were not signed, so we don't know who wrote them. But that I think that as we think about how we use history, we also have to figure out the different mechanisms that different communities have used to protest their, um, their, their, their plight and their status. And, um, and that this, I think, is a form of, of resistance, of letting people know what was going on. One of the things that happened in the black community is something called National Legal Health Week, which we do not know a lot about. I'm trying to get one of my graduate students to write it. They don't write it, I'll end up writing it. Uh, but it was a mass movement that started first in um, Virginia. This is Robert Russell Moten, who was head of Hampton Institute, then became head of Tuskegee Institute. And he had this week of talking about health care in the African American community. And it was picked up by Booker T. Washington um, and when, um, before he died. 
And one of the things that Booker T. Washington said is, is oh, I got interested in health, is without health, it will be impossible for us to have permanent success in business and property getting and in acquiring education. Without health and long life, all else fails. Now, I was at a conference several years ago, and I was not as eloquent as Booker T. Washington, because I said, if you're sick, dying, or dead, you know, nothing else is going to matter, so. Um, maybe one day someone will have that out for me. Um, um, but one of the things that happened, how he got involved with this, is work of Monroe Work, who was a sociologist, head of uh, records at uh, Tuskegee. And I was talking to Tom about this, that at the annual Tuskegee Negro Conference in 1914, Work presented some staggering but optimistic, and the reason I put optimistic is that he said that diseases were preventable, as opposed to this fatalistic model that black folks were going to die. And he talked about the economic cost, and he estimated that approximately 225,000 African Americans died in the South annually. Uh, almost a half a million were seriously ill, and that 45% of diseases were preventable. And he said that because of the economic loss, it was about 300 million at that time. And he tried to use this, one, to get the black community involved, but also to get the white community involved in terms of, of at this time, remember, most of uh, African Americans were in the South, to get them involved in black health issues. And so Tuskegee became the center of, of spreading the gospel of health, and this was National Negro Health Week. There were school events, mass meetings, clinics, cleanup. Uh, there was radio programs. Um, the men were maybe some of the leaders of the movement, but many times women were the willing workers of it and doing all the work. No editorial comment on my part there. But anyway, uh, this is Virginia Hope, uh, Burns Hope who uh, was head of the National, the, the Neighborhood Union in Atlanta. Uh, she started to sell the town, but when she presented her health work, she sent people from the center into the community to find out what the community thought about their health and how it should be advanced. Not a lot of work has been done on, on her either. And so nurses were involved. This is the community. You see, this is the number of, um, of communities involved in national people health care. So, I mean, what, you know, this, for me, this is a question. You know, we just know the general overview. We don't know um, what were involved in all the materials, but there were, as I said, there were radio shows, there were sermons. On well, one day might be school day where there were vaccines. They were also involved in social hygiene. So they talked about uh, venereal disease. So uh, we need to know more about and, and about this. And did it differ in one community as opposed to another? Um, what happened uh, in um, in the 1930s? National Negro Health Week was transported was transferred from Tuskegee to the federal government. So it became part of the U.S. Public Health Service. There was an office of Negro Health Work in the federal government that ended in the 1950s. It ended in large part because of the efforts of this man, of this nation. Uh, this was uh, this is Dr. Roscoe C. Brown. He was uh, uh, he was head. Of, he was a dentist and head of the office of Negro Health Work. What happened is that Black medical civil rights activists started saying, you know. This is segregation that addressing the health care of African Americans should one not be just done by African Americans and it should not be just in a separate setup. So there's starting to be concerns about having separate black institutions. For example, in 1950, the National Association of Colored Graduate Nurses had this big gala in New York saying that it was going to dismantle because it was not needed anymore, because black women could go into the uh, um, uh, American Nurses Association. Um, Fifteen years later, this, they did start the Black Nurses Association. They had to rethink some things. Um, but that in the 1950s, you see that folks wanted to have desegregation, integration of the subject. But I want to talk about the medical civil rights movement, but before I talk about the medical civil rights movement, I think that it's important for us 
to think about this in terms of by the 1950s, we started to have, as some of you have talked about earlier today, the love affair with the medical model. So you don't see the physicians working with the nurses the same way. You don't see the physicians working with the public health folks in the same way. You don't see physicians working with the teachers in the same way. And so that the solutions focus on a couple things. One, grassroots activism, legal strategies, and legislative strategies, all to get more black physicians and also to get black Americans access to hospitals. So you don't see, you know, trying to, in the same way as you did earlier in the century, to also to try to deal with education or housing or even criminal justice. So it started to be a medical problem. So this is from 1963 from Herb Block, who was the, uh, the cartoonist at the Washington Post. And um, here is, uh, sorry, but you have an incurable skin condition. And it's Lily White Medical Society, Lily White Hospital, and then MD. So that trying to get black physicians into hospitals and into medical societies became part of the, uh, so the, the major focus, and also the patients in the hospital, but of the medical civil rights movement. So the desegregation of medical education. This, um, in um, the 1940s, late 1940s, one third of medical schools in the United States, mostly in the South, did not admit this was the first African American to go to a school in the Deep South. Her name was, was uh, Edith Irby, now Edith Irby Jones. She's also later the first black woman to become head of the Journal of the National Medical Association. And she also wrote a vicious, not that vicious, uh, a critical uh, assessment of Peck Report because she said basically, it said, well, you know, black people behave themselves and, you know, that. Uh, disparities would not be there. Yeah. This is her first day of medical school. Some of you who might, you know, might realize this is in Little Rock, Arkansas. Nine years later was the desegregation of Central High School where there were mobs, <coughs> federal troops, and jury crimes. She had no problem She went to medical school. Um, and one of the reasons why, uh, without a lawsuit, and one of the reasons why it happened was that Arkansas felt that uh, there were all these court cases going along that they were going to have to provide medical education uh, 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 to uh, an African American. They didn't have the money for a lawsuit. But this is Herman Brightman who was the first black uh, person to go to the University of Texas Medical Branch in Dallas. Totally different story. Texas tried to establish, a, well they did, they could get, could get money for it actually, a separate black medical school. They were just going to have separate, you know, with him opening it by himself. <laughs> um, but then, by, by the 50s, medical education started to become too expensive. And one of the things, in terms of the civil rights movement, you know, we might know about Brown versus Board of Education in terms of desegregation of public schools, but what had predated that were lawsuits at graduate and professional education. Because it was going to be more, basically what Thurgood Marshall said, he said, if you're going to be segregated, we're going to make sure you're equal. So that, so that what happened is that to have at this time a medical school was going to be expensive for states to have it. So, so that what I'm trying to say too here is that just because it was easy for even Herbie Jones to get into medical school did not mean it was easy for Herbie Barnett to get to, to medical school. So then there was desegregation of hospitals. Um, the Hill Burton Act of 1947 provided money for the construction of hospitals um, to both public hospitals and voluntary hospitals. But it had this 
anti-discrimination clause that you had to admit both. In places where they're separate but equal, you could have separate but equal. So the Hill Burton was used to create white exclusive, exclusive white hospitals and also exclusively black hospitals. But you know, this is the Board of Education of, of Topeka in 1954. So what was is there was there um, uh, a corollary in hospitals? And there was a case, called the Simpkins case. This was George Simpkins, who was a dentist in Greensboro, North Carolina, but he also was head of the local NAACP, National Association for the Advancement of Colored People. And he filed suit against a hospital in Greensboro because black dentists, doctors, and patients could not go. But Greensboro, so the hospital was most of the The hospital said, well, we don't need to do that because there is a black hospital down the road, you know. Um, but what the Supreme Court ruled was that um, that they had to let them in the hospital because it's unconstitutional, because they got federal money. And it said that um, these are the 15th, the 5th and the 14th Amendment that violated those uh, clauses. And so it was heralded as the Brown v. Board of Education's decision for a hospital. It also had an impact on other court decisions in that hospitals that did not receive uh, federal money, and this was a, a court case, Eat v. Grobs. Civil Rights uh, Act, in terms of not being able to discriminate in, uh, in, uh, in or agencies that receive federal assistance, and Medicare and Medicaid legislation. This is briefly goes through the civil rights movement, but they wanted to show that with the civil rights movement, not the civil rights movement, the scope had gotten narrow. So we started at the beginning of the century having this broad vision of public health and of, of uh, addressing disparities to being more narrow in the medical model. Um, what are some of the things I think we can talk about in terms of lessons learned? Um, one is the, uh, the, the significance of conceptual frameworks and framing solutions. That if tuberculosis was seen as something that was inherent, something that was biological, the answer would be there's nothing I can do. It's in their bodies. It's very different if you say, well, maybe it has something to do with uh, housing. Maybe it has something to do with the occupation that someone has. I think that we, in terms of health disparities, that we need, and in, inequities, in that we need to have some local historical studies to go into depth to see what happened in a particular community. The other thing is that what we are not good about is working, we, we talk about transdisciplinary, but what we are not good at working at, which they were in the beginning of the 20th century, and I'm going to borrow something that, and I always give credit for this time, is that, that those of us who are looking at racial health disparities also need to be working and talking with folks who are doing educational inequalities, people who are doing income inequality, people who are working in criminal justice. Just to have, because if it's going to be broader, and we're talking about social determinants, we need to talk to what other people are working in, it, in this area. And that's what they did, I think, much better at the uh, beginning of the 20th, uh, 20th century. Uh, and that also points to the importance of broad-based uh, collaboration. One of the things that, uh, that did not happen um, in, in the early 20th century, even in the late 20th century, there were not many collaborations between people who were looking at the health of different ethnic groups. So I was great to hear you talk about in Los Angeles, this whole, you know, this, this pan, what was it, pan ethnic health network? Yeah, pan ethnic health network. Because I think sometimes what happens, we start fighting over a small piece of the pie that we need to learn to talk to each other, to figure out what each other's stuff is all about. Um, because even though you know I started and I focused on African Americans, one because that's my area of expertise. You know, I, I just hate it when people say, well, "Why don't you come, come and talk about you know race and ethnicity and talk about every ethnic group there is?" You know, 
uh, without any depth or, or, or anything. Um, that uh, we're, sh we're shifting, and that the history of other groups in this country in terms of health care is not as well known as it is in the African American community. And the, and the history of the African American community is not that well known either. But so we need to have more of those studies. Um, I think one of the things we look at the career of the boys and also for Jimmy Alexander is this emphasis on research based activism. That you take your research and you do something.